Let's pray. Father, open your word to us. We ask, be our teacher today. Um, stir our hearts with love for the Lord Jesus, I pray in his name. Amen. The story is told of an old man who lived by the ocean in Maine. Every morning at sunup, he would go out to the point overlooking the ocean and raise a flag. Every night, he would lower the flag. Boats going past would look for the landmark known as Henson's Point. As you might expect, one day Mr. Henson died. The town folk buried him under the flagpole on Henson's Point. The next morning, the flag was flying. That night, it was lowered. There were all kinds of rumors as to what was actually taking place. What really happened was that the groundskeeper, in order to preserve the memory of Mr. Henson, raised the flag each morning and lowered it each night. Did it for years. When he was asked why he was so faithful in doing it, he said to preserve the memory of Mr. Henson. They'd ask, what's he to you? He'd smile. When the groundskeeper died many, many years later, it was discovered that his net worth was in the range of $4.5 million. His will, when read, said, Mr. Henson left me everything. I now pass it on to my son. May he preserve my memory. The Lord's Supper is an institution given to us by Jesus to preserve his memory. As we read 1 Corinthians 11, verses uh, 17 through the end of the chapter, through 34, we see the Lord Jesus himself said, do this in memory of me. When someone leaves you $4.5 million, it's not a hard thing to raise and lower the flag in his memory on a regular basis. But when the Son of God comes to earth, reduces himself to humanity, and then goes to the cross for lost, miserable, rebellious love, it seems to me that I need to preserve his memory. And I might as well do it the way he asked me to do it. And that's why I love this portion of scripture. Uh, Bill McRae gave us several things that we need to know about this, and so I'm going to just quickly work through them with you and hope that uh, it'll be as meaningful to you as it is to me. First off, the Lord's Supper is known as an ordinance of the church. Basically two ordinances that evangelicals recognize, the ordinance of baptism and the ordinance of the Lord's Supper. Other groups have more. We have contained it to that because we define an ordinance in this way. Something that was prescribed by the Lord Jesus. You go to the doctor, he'll give you some medication, he prescribes, he says, this is specifically for you. And he fine-tunes exactly what we need. Prescribed by the Lord Jesus was this ordinance of baptism. He said, go and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And while we don't have time to talk about baptism, we need to understand that that is something that the Lord Jesus prescribed for us, that and the Lord's Supper. It was something that was practiced by the early church. You could track it all through the early church. And while it's been changed and, and modified and so on over the centuries, both of those ordinances are still very much a part of Christian teaching, Christian uh, practice. The third thing that we would say about an ordinance is it was something that not only was practiced by the early church, but actually had some theological exposition about it. In other words, you can go to the writing of the apostles and find teaching about both baptism and the Lord's Supper. 
And so we would say those are the three things that are essential as far as defining an ordinance. It was prescribed by the Lord Jesus. It was practiced by the early church. It was expounded theologically, taught on by the apostles in the, in the New Testament. Uh, just a quick rundown for baptism. I've already quoted Matthew 28. Uh, Acts, the whole book of Acts suggests that the practice of immersion was carried on throughout the early church. And then we find teaching about it in Colossians 2, Romans 6, 1 Peter 3. I think there's other portions that you could go to for teaching about the ordinance of baptism. The emphasis there is on our entrance into the Christian life through redemption by Christ, through his blood. And we enter into his death, and uh, that would be the symbolism of baptism. For the Lord's Supper, he taught it in in all four of the Gospels, but we'll say Matthew 26, um, all through the book of Acts, it was practiced by the early church uh, daily from house to house in Acts chapter 2. By the time you're in Acts 20, they met on the first day of the week, and it was the practice of the church to break bread together. Whenever you see that break bread in Acts, they're talking about the communion and the fellowship that associated that. And then here it is in 1 Corinthians 11, where it's expounded. We also caught a verse or two in chapter 10. We didn't stress it then, but he does refer to the Lord's Supper as the, and the oneness that's uh, uh, described by the Lord's Supper, how we actually enter into uh, what Christ has done for us when we are involved in that uh, remembrance of him. And that emphasizes our continuance in the Christian life. There's three important implications that, that every ordinance has, and, and they are this, and, and please know this. Number one, the first implication is it's only for believers. It's only for believers. That's why we don't practice infant baptism, because we don't believe that they have yet come to faith in Christ as infants. Infant baptism is something that came out, about the, out of about the 7th century, as far as I know, um, maybe before that, but there was household baptism and so on. The whole concept of sprinkling, you can track that through um, church history, I think about 700, something like that. At any rate, uh, while baptism was modified, um, the ordinance was established first only for believers. Same thing with the Lord's Supper. Okay? The second point that I would make by implication, an ordinance is for all believers. It's not for a special few. It's for all who are true believers in the Lord Jesus. And the third thing, and this is where it gets a little bit preachy. I said I wasn't going to preach much, but it's the obligation. Every believer has an obligation to be involved in the two ordinances that have been given to us. Every believer needs to be baptized. Adult Adult, uh, uh, believers, baptism, we believe by immersion, uh, and it's something that if you have not yet obeyed Christ with, you need to think about that. I'll drop it there. It's the obligation of every Christian. When it comes to the Lord's Supper, Jesus said, do this, do this in remembrance of me. Now just let me, let me imagine with you for a moment, if something is my obligation then I need to be involved with it. But really, what is it motivates us? What is it that derives us? And um, we've tried to stress all semester in, in, in every way that it's the love that Christ had for us that flows over into our lives and allows us to love him in return. Now, folks, it's difficult to express love to someone without doing the things they ask. That's, that's a, a part of the marriage relationship. I have a honey-do list. And it's not um, a bad thing. It's, it's, a, it's part of my obligation as a husband to respond to my wife when she asks something. I do the same for her. And when the Lord Jesus says to us, do this in remembrance of me, it's an act of love. We worship that way. We know God's will, can you believe it? By being obedient to him as we obey him, and especially in this area, or at least in this area, we obey him and he opens us up to us understanding. I think it's even victorious to have a, 
a victor a victorious. It's even difficult to have a victorious life in Christ unless we're being obedient in this way. So as far as the ordinance is concerned, it's only for believers, it's for all believers, but it becomes the obligation of every believer. All right, the second point is that here we have something that links Judaism and Christianity. It flows right out of the Passover. Anybody take Judaism this last a week ago? Any of you take it? Shucks, you missed it. All right, you have to come back and take it next year then. Okay, great, great study. But the Jewish culture is rich with symbolism and meaning for us. And the Lord Jesus, as a practicing Jew, went into the Passover supper with delight. He said, I, I'm just thrilled to be able to, to do this Passover with you. And it was right there in the Passover feast that he instituted the Lord's Supper. And I see a link. He brought those two things together. And, and uh, really what was he was saying, well, we'll get to that, but, but he was saying uh, from here on out, things are going to be a little bit different because your Passover lamb will soon be slain for you and you'll be able to enter into a permanent relationship with God through the blood of Christ. Fantastic, as demonstrated in the Lord's Supper. Third point. We have clearly, uh, clearly stated in the New Testament, I've already said this about three times, that from the first day, the first days of the church, up through today, and I believe continuing on until the Lord Jesus comes back, because he says, till he returns, until then, there will be this observance of the death of the Lord Jesus, okay, his cross work for us. It's the breaking of the bread. In, um, in the early church, they would break the bread. Then they would eat their meal together. And then they would pass the cup. And they would remember the Lord Jesus. In, in, in many ways, this communion is the highest form of fellowship that God's people can be involved in. I don't know if you thought about it that way, but um, 1 John talks about the fellowship that we have with the Father and with his Son, that we're linked through the Holy Spirit. Um, this is another way of saying that, that we are in fellowship. And as I take the bread and pass it to you and you take the bread, and as I take the cup and pass it to you and you take the cup, we're saying we're in this together. We're in fellowship, not only with each other, but also with Almighty God. Not bad, huh? It's kind of a neat thing to think about that way. By Acts chapter 20, as I said, they were doing it on the first day of the week. They probably met on Sunday, um, known as the, the day of the resurrection. Um, they most likely met on the evening of that first day after uh, perhaps they had worked. They met to break bread. That was their purpose. That was why they came. And the church today makes a serious mistake if they don't gather to break bread, to remember the Lord, to have this wonderful institution of the Lord's Supper. As fast as I'm turning pages here, you can tell I'm skipping a little bit. Um, you'll probably flunk the test as a result, but tough, I'm going to get done. In Corinth, there was a bit of a problem. And as you, <laughs> you may have come to guess, you know, any problem? Yeah, it's in Corinth. Well, the problem was they were abusing the Lord's Supper. And, and here's the way they were abusing it. Like I said, first they would pass the bread, then they would eat their meal together. Well, as it turns out, and you read it, you kind of interpolate from the context that what they were doing is they would gather together for this common meal, but the really wealthy ones would bring in their, uh, uh, their barbecue ribs. No, no, they didn't eat pork. Oh, um, anyway, <laughs> they, they would bring in this huge meal with a lot of wine. And they would have a wonderful time, just a party time. 
eating and drinking while they remembered the Lord. They're poor brothers and sisters, and remember there were tons of slaves in the city of Corinth, and so a lot of them had gotten saved. And they would come in, and they would pass them the bread, and they'd take their little bit, you know, and it was probably a little unleavened cracker at the time, so they'd get their little nibble of that, and here comes the cup, and they take a little sip of that. And everybody else was having a, a party over there, and create a few problems, can you imagine? Worse yet, as, as we understand it, um, not only would they drink a little wine, they would drink quite a lot of wine. And they were becoming inebriated while they were remembering the Lord. Paul had a problem with that. Do you? You're supposed to say yes, Caleb. Yes, I have a problem. Yeah. Yeah, they were getting drunk. Here at this, this wonderful, wonderful event, they're getting drunk. And so Paul writes them here and suggests that they do something a little bit different. He did this time and time again as he wrote this letter. And this is just another one of those areas. Um, what he's getting at is that he wanted them, verses 23 through 26, leave the Lord's Supper for its real purpose. What's the real purpose of the Lord's Supper? Party time? Drunkenness? What do you think? What, what's that? We're going to remember the Lord. Paul says, that's why you're here. Now, I don't think it's wrong for, for Christians to gather and have a meal together and then break bread. That's, he's not saying that's wrong. But what he is saying is, you have liberty to have the meal, but don't, don't abuse or neglect or ignore or de-emphasize what you're really there for, which is to remember the Lord. Get his point? Now, in our culture, we don't um, often have a meal together. Some people do. That's great. Uh, sometimes in the dorms, you guys will gather and, and break bread together. That's great. Uh, no problem with that whatsoever. But when you're doing it, realize why you're doing it. What's, it, what's important? What's, what's being remembered here? And it's the, the death of our Lord Jesus when he shed his blood, when his body was broken on our behalf. That's what it's really all about. Do I take communion in order to maintain my salvation? I, I'm getting a few good responses. I, I've got 50 people in here. Do you take communion? 58, sorry. Do you take communion in order to maintain your salvation? No. Thank you. Thank you. We don't need the Lord's Supper to keep us saved. We need him, right? He's the one we need. He's the one who keeps us. But we're doing what he asked us to do. And so it isn't out of... Um, a sense of I'll maintain my salvation by showing up when the church remembers Christ. It's out of a sense of appreciation, love. I even said earlier, responsibility. One of the things that I notice is that the Lord's Supper is being more and more diminished in churches today. Have you noticed that? The Lord's Supper isn't as important as it should be. I'll get to that in a little bit. But that's something that, that uh, I think we need to address and need to uh, take seriously. In Corinth, they made uh, an orgy out of it, which was wrong. We kind of neglect it or make it sort of, oh, okay, we'll remember the Lord. And that's wrong too, okay? I just want you to have the right heart as we go into this. According to verses... Uh, 16 and 17 of chapter 10. Would you just slip back there for a second? Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. There's a oneness, a sharing, a partnership, a fellowship. 
And when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we're expressing, in one sense, our participation in the person and work of Christ. That's a good thing. We need to do that often. We need to express our, partic- our participation in Christ. Right? That's what life is, folks. We're in Christ. And I remember the Lord to remind myself of how vital it is that I'm in Christ. According to Bill McRae in Taking the Bread, I'm saying, quote, I recognize that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. He has a body prepared by God, originated in the virgin birth, which he took so he could die, in which he gave himself in death for me. I am therefore participating in the redemptive, atoning work of Jesus Christ, which was accomplished when he gave himself in that body in death for me. Did you get all that? Okay. I take the cup, and I'm saying, I recognize that the blood of Jesus Christ has paid my debt. It was a payment to God for my sin, and I am trusting in the precious blood of Jesus Christ, shed for sinners, shed for rebels, shed for me. I'm trusting in that shed blood as the basis for my forgiveness and my salvation before God. Every time we take communion, every time we remember the Lord Jesus, those are the, the, the words that we're saying. And, and, you know, we don't memorize that and say it as a ritual, but, boy, when that bread goes to your lips, that's what you're doing. You're saying, ah, I want to remember here. Here was a body that was broken for me. And I drink that, that cup and I say, whoa, there was bloodshed. For me, Peter calls it the precious blood of Christ. How fantastic. How wonderful. And I want to express that over and over and over and over again because I need that kind of remembrance in my life. Not only is it an expression of our relationship with Jesus, this is kind of neat. When I take the bread and pass it to my brother Caleb, what we're saying is, hey, we're in this together. We could, you know, we do what all the signs, you know, we do this and stuff. <laughs> but it's the same thing. It's we're in this together. You and I are brothers. Here, pass it to Sister Shaley. Shaley, we're in this together. Come on, take it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just pretending. Okay. We're in this together. This is my sis. This is family. That's kind of nice. Especially in a world where it's pretty lonely. Pretty scary. I have some place I can go, I can gather, and my sis is there for me. Right? Beautiful. We have communion with Jesus, with one another. Unity. Unity. Now, let's be real here. One of the more insulting things that I could do to God is to take those emblems expressing my communion with the body of Christ and yet harbor some feelings of bitterness or resentment or hatred towards you. Oh, all right, here you go. Can't unpink the bread. Does that ever happen in our, in our body, in our churches? Uh-uh. No, and Paul says, hey, you know what? That's part of the examination process. That's why you do it often. Because I know stuff is going to come up between you. Good grief. Living with reverence is a, is a chore. Right? Can't even remember your name. Right? We need this. But we do it often And we examine ourselves, which we'll get to. We examine ourselves to make sure we get that part of it cleaned up. It's very important to be in communion when I am expressing communion. One of the reasons we should do it often. Number five. The Lord's death is a memorial. The Lord's supper is a memorial of his death. 
verses 23 through 26. Let me read them. I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Wow. What in the world does that mean? Well, I'm going to give you four views, and, I, and they have some big names with them, and it's in the test, so you better get all this down, all right? The first view is called transubstantiation. Don't ask me to spell it. Transubstantiation. In this view, when an ordained priest prays for the bread and the cup, the body and blood of Christ actually appear. In other words, he turns miraculously, God turns, he, the, the church says, the, the wafer into the body of Christ, the real body. And so when you put that in your mouth, you are eating the body of Christ. When you drink that wine, it now has turned into the blood of Jesus. And you're actually drinking his blood. Transubstantiation. Another view, view two, all right? And I, I don't know where this name came from, uh, but anyway, it's called con, C-O-N, substantiation, consubstantiation. By the way, uh, what group would practice or hold that first, first view? Did anybody know? That's the Roman Catholic view, okay? Trans, transubstantiation. Huh? Consubstantiation would be a view that Martin Luther held. And so those who would be called Lutherans would hold this view. And let me get it right here. I usually mess this up pretty good. Luther's view was that the bread is still bread, the wine is still wine, but Christ's body is in, with, under, and around the bread. Christ's blood is in, with, under, and around the wine. And so while it's a little bit different than what the Roman Catholic Church teaches, it still has this flavor of actually somehow involving the actual body and blood of Christ. Third view, and, and actually I'm going to break it into four, but uh, the third and fourth view are pretty close, pretty close, all right? Um, a fellow named uh, John Calvin, as I understand it, held a view that when we talk about this is my body, this is my blood, what Christ was saying was that he would be spiritually present. He would be spiritually present in the bread and in the wine. Are you getting a little confused? Yeah, me too. Nelson? Between the second and the third? That, that, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Calvin and Luther differed over it. There was enough difference for those two, but I'm not sure I could describe it for you. So I would suggest that would be something that you'd want to study and see if you could get into a little bit. Zwingli, another reformer, said... Fourth view, the bread signifies the body, the wine signifies the blood. Symbolically, we have a physical representation of the body of Christ, a symbolic representation. In the cup, we have a symbolic representation of his blood, still bread, Still wine, or fruit of the vine, I guess is the best way to say it, but symbolic. Now, of those four, which view do you think I hold? 
number four, because I've already told you that way back when, that this is symbolism. I really believe it's symbolism. Uh, love substantiation. No. Um, symbolic? Sim symbolic ordinance. Okay. Whatever view, we need to understand that something unique and wonderful was happening. There was a transition taking place. They were, they were celebrating the Passover, which was um, a remembrance of when God miraculously took their people out of Egypt and brought them into the promised land. And they regularly remember that on a yearly basis. But what Christ is doing here is saying to them, there's something new happening. I am the Passover lamb. I'm what you've been symbolically doing all these years. And within hours, I will be going to the cross of Calvary where I'll shed my blood, the Paschal lamb. I will shed my blood for all sin. And that's why John, when he was out, John the Baptist, when he was out preaching, he said, look, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And three years later, his disciples gather in this upper room and he says, get ready, guys, it's coming. Hours away now. Remember me. Remember me. A new covenant is going to be written. We've already suggested it's a reminder of, of you to me, says Jesus. Um, I, don't, I don't know if you saw me trotting around the dining hall bragging about my two babies, but um, there's my Benson. He's the newest, okay? And I hold him close right now. I keep him in my little hip pocket to remind me to pray for him. That's Benson. Like him? You're dumb. That isn't Benson. <laughs> That's a picture of Benson. <laughs> we have reminders. We have pictures. All over our house we have pictures of weddings, trips, events, graduations. Wife, what, what do they do? What are they all about? Just a reminder to bring back some pleasant memories of a, of a wonderful experience. Okay, here it is. The Lord's Supper is a reminder of Jesus and what he's done for us. It's also a proclamation of the gospel. This is so wonderful. This is so cool. I can bring my unsafe friend to the Lord's Supper, and while we're gathered, and I know some circles you're supposed to be really quiet, but I can actually be explaining to my friend what's going on. See that bread up there? That's a reminder that Christ took all my sins in his own body, and I can show him the verses associated with that. Hey, psst, see that cup? Or in our case, cups. See those cups? <laughs> That's a, that's a reminder that Jesus actually shed his blood for me. He did it for me. You wouldn't die for me, but he did. And I can preach the gospel with this, with this marvelous event. And so, yeah, you're not supposed to whisper much during the Lord's Supper, but if you're preaching the gospel, I'll, I'll give you permission, okay? It's okay. What a fantastic expression of what Christ has done for us. Keep that one in mind. It's a wonderful time of celebration. It's a time of thanksgiving. Didn't the Lord Jesus give thanks? Yes, he did. In fact, the word Eucharist means giving thanks. It's a, it's a celebration. In extra-biblical sources, we've, we read that there was actually a time when uh, during this remembrance 
that they would express their thanks. Some of you have grown up in what we call a brethren tradition. And we actually take time for each other to share expressions of thanks to God. It's kind of a neat thing. I kind of like it. It's not the only way to do communion. You know, it isn't the sanctified way that God sent down from heaven. But it's, it's a neat way, and it's something you should think about and something you should be familiar with. Where we stop and we just reflect. It's, it's a time of incredible, incredible joy. It's a continuing remembrance of the Lord Jesus that's been a part of church history. Quote from John Calvin, The Lord's Supper should be observed very frequently and at least once a week. John Wesley, who's uh, known for a Methodist tradition, said the Lord's Supper should be observed once a week. C.H. Spurgeon, shame on the Christian church that she should put communion off to less than once a week. They who once know the sweetness of each Lord's Day celebrating the Lord's Supper will, be, uh, will not be content to put it off to less frequent seasons. There's an emphasis on thanksgiving. We have songs, we have prayers, we have words of encouragement. We give thanks for the bread. It's a time of incredible, well, I'm getting ahead of myself, but, it, but, but there's, there's a sense of joy involved in a celebration. A sense of wonder and amazement and appreciation. Guess what? We might even laugh at the Lord's... Oh, did you hear what he said? It's solemn. It's, 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 it's enormously powerful and, and sobering to think what we're doing. But I tell you what, isn't it the very, the very essence of what our life is now? Isn't it the very heart of why we're who we are and why we're going where we're going and I have two minutes to finish all of this? It's important. It's a celebration. Solemn, but we don't have to be morbid. We want to celebrate what Christ has done. It's a time of coronation. Sometimes we even sing, crown him with many crowns. And what we're doing is looking forward. This is a time that's the Lord's. It's the Lord's Supper. Someone said it's the Christian Pledge of Allegiance. Isn't that interesting? In the, uh, in the Roman army, the emperor required that there be a pledge of allegiance given to him. You know what they called it? A sacrament. A sacrament of allegiance. Allegiance. And this is a time when I say I pledge allegiance to the Lord Jesus who shed his blood for me when he took my sins in his own body on the cross. And I'm going to give him all I've got. I'm giving my allegiance to him. Quickly, quickly, don't throw anything. I've got one minute. I'm going to go a minute over, okay? It anticipates his return. Verse 26 says, it's until he comes... We'll be with him. We'll never be separated from him again. We'll be in his presence. <laughs> and I can hardly wait. But until he comes, he says, remember me. Remember me. Final point. It demands examination. And I'll pick this up. We, we don't have time to do it justice now. I'll pick this up on Monday, and we'll also go into the next section. Mm -hmm.